Um, hi, everybody. I'm Chetani, a PhD student at Clarkson University. I, on behalf of the Clarkson AAAR student chapter, would like to welcome all to the August lecture. Amy Sullivan uh, is not able to join with us today. She sent this message to share with you. Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR in Dallas. Okay, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our sixth in our monthly series of ASNT paper lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR, being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. With this initiative, we hope to be able to highlight the amazing research happening in our community, tie our journal to other activities, and also give us an opportunity to all come together outside of the annual conference. And so each month, the editors of ASNT are selecting a high impact paper to be presented by its authors. These lectures are being recorded and they'll be later posted to AAAR's new YouTube channel, which you can access through AAAR's webpage under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of our student chapters is serving as host and the student chapters have also organized a journal club which meets the week before the lecture to discuss the paper to be presented. So students keep an eye out for the emails about those. And lastly, I just wanted to thank everyone who's made this possible and also all of you for joining us. And so with that, I will turn it over to our student chapter from Clarkson University to get us started. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. We can proceed today's lecture and let me introduce Dr. Claudio Massolini from Michigan Tech University. Dr. Massolini is a faculty member in the physics department and the atmospheric sciences program at Michigan Technological University since 2008. He earned a laurea in physics in 1995 at the University of Trento, Italy, and his PhD in atmospheric sciences in 2003 at the Desert Research University of Reno, Nevada. And he was a postdoc at the Los Alamos National Laboratory from 2005 to 2008. His research focuses on study of atmosphere, atmospheric particles with an emphasis on their optical and morphological properties. And he's gonna talk about the paper that they published recently, Dual Cavity Spectrometer, for monitoring broadband light extinction by atmospheric aerosols. He's gonna talk about 45 minutes and we will have 15 minutes after that for a discussion. Meanwhile, I would like to ask you to mute yourselves and post any questions in the chat here. And having said that, Dr. Massolini, we're ready for you. Thank you, Chetan, and uh, thank you, um, Jackie and Amy, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and uh, AAA, let me see. Um, let me share the presentation. Uh, let me know if you can see this. Is that okay? Yes. And you can see my uh, laser pointer, uh, pointer as well? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, like Chetani was saying, I'm going to talk about um, this development of an instrument to measure light extinction by atmospheric aerosols uh, over a broad um, range. Um, and I, I use quotation because um, in reality, broad uh, is related to the ability to uh, have uh, mirrors that reflect, uh, I will talk about what I mean uh, here in a moment. Uh, reflects over a broad range, so it's broad in a relative sense. But anyway, I will talk about it in a moment. Substantially, what I'm talking about is uh, about 400 nanometers to about 550 nanometers, 140, 150 nanometers uh, range. Um, I put, I like to put this picture sometimes in my presentation. It has nothing to do with the broadband uh, cavity mass uh, spectrometer, but um, it's a place, uh, where, among others, where I uh, work uh, for several years to collect uh, uh, aerosol and uh, look at them with electron microscopy, which is uh, one of the main things that we do in my group. And uh, um, this is a bit of a motivation looking at these pictures that were collected at the site, um, and they're very similar to other pictures collected uh, everywhere around the world. 
uh, when you look at an electron microscope, you see really the complexity of this uh, aerosols. They are not simple spheres. Uh, we might, uh, you know, sometimes uh, kind of uh, think um, they have different shapes and uh, techniques in different ways, and they're very complex. And so, um, obviously, it's possible to model this, but uh, we still need uh, measurements uh, to compare the models with and uh, to understand their fundamental properties and uh, the other parameterization. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I wanted also to mention before I move on that I geared this presentation more toward um, students. So there will be a lot of background, uh, some of which might not be perfectly accurate or anything, but uh, mostly to um, get some point across. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I uh, geared it toward students is not only because I think that the future of uh, in our community, but also because um, I'm not really an expert in captainants. Uh, um, this uh, is uh, you know, the, the page of the journal that we published um, uh, of ASD. And if you look at the um, outer I'm neither the first and uh, the last one, to, uh, the first is who did the, all the work and the last one is uh, who uh, had the idea, uh, let's say, or contributed mostly conceptually or uh, you know, programmatically. Uh, in any event, um, so I really want to thank um, especially three of the uh, co-authors that did most of the work here. Uh, Aswarya uh, Sassandran um, is, uh, was a PhD at the uh, National Institute of Technology in India. I'm saying was because she graduated this, um, this week, actually. Um, and so congratulations to her. And uh, together with Susan Matai, which also comes from NIT, but is now a PhD student at Michigan Tech. And... Um, uh, was doing the internship right now at KNNL. Uh, they did most of the really hands-on work in terms not only of uh, lab measurements and you know, putting together the, um, the instrument, uh, doing a lot of uh, you know painful alignment uh, calibrations, um, writing software to collect the data, um, uh, collect the data, do the experiments for that, uh, analyze them, and writing the paper. Actually, they did really most of the work on that. Um, and uh, I really want to thank also uh, Professor Rabbi Varma because uh, he's uh, the expert really in this field. And uh, it's because of him that we were able to do this. Um, uh, obviously, I, I thank the uh, AAAR. And I want to say that uh, as I, I have a slide, uh, uh, next slide coming up, that is maybe a little bit unusual, but um, I, I will talk a little bit about more about this. But um, substantially, this is a very low budget uh, project. Uh, we had very minimal. Uh, money to develop this instrument, and so it could definitely be uh, done much better in you know, higher performance with uh, a full project. Um, and uh, the, the money, the, 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 that uh, grant, the, it was a little grant from uh, the Elizabeth uh, Richards and Center for Quantum Phenomena and Michigan Tech. That's really what uh, uh, allowed us to do uh, this work, together with uh, instrumentation that I had uh, before. Um, that I could uh, acquire because of the physics department of research science program and the Earth and Planetary Space Science Institute at Michigan Tech. Uh, the physics department also allowed uh, Ashwarya to work with us for a summer. Uh, finally, I want to end this uh, long acknowledgement slide with uh, um, saying that uh, all our work is done within our group in the environmental optics lab. So I have to thank all the students that are working there. And uh, we are supported typically in our research by NSF and DOE, although this did not contribute too much to this development specifically. All right, so um, I debated with myself if I should talk about this or not, but in the end, because I think there are a lot of students and maybe young investigators in the audience, I felt like uh, it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the unusual story, let's say, of this development. Um, just to um, kind of maybe give a tiny bit of inspiration or, or and to encourage um, younger um, researchers to, if they have an idea or something, even if it's not you know, a big dream or anything, but uh, that they cannot um, carry on immediately, um, they can maybe uh, you know, put it in a closet for a little bit and uh, um, give it uh, back later on when they have the possibility to do so. So, in fact, I, you know, I started looking into uh, broadband sources um, during a uh, PhD seminar that I did uh, in my graduate studies um, at uh, uh, Reno, um, where I had to pick a topic on uh, lasers for applications to atmospheric science. 
And I picked uh, topics related to this development that uh, was very fascinating for me. It was the ability to use very high power, short pulse lasers uh, shown directly in the atmosphere to generate uh, white light uh, directly in the atmosphere. I had no hope uh, at the time to you know, uh, be able to purchase this big facility or to work with this big facility. So there was no uh, uh, direct application, but that's really just like the idea. And when I was uh, doing research for that presentation, I found out that the super continuum uh, generation in, uh, in lasers uh, or in solids was, um, was uh, observed already in the late uh, uh, 60s. And Alfano and Shapiro with their uh, seminar paper in 1970 uh, uh, were really the one that uh, brought this to the community and showed that uh, it was something really interesting, uh, the generation of the super continuum light. So this is a white light substantially emitted over a very broad range uh, of wavelengths and uh, it has all the directional properties of a laser in, in a sense. Uh, so it's very useful. And uh, back then I, I had the um, dreams, you know, to apply this maybe to photoacoustic spectroscopy, maybe to extinction measurement, nephilometry, uh, maybe to use it as a LIDAR um, source, um, you know, for other remote measurements in the atmosphere. Uh, but again, I didn't have the resources back then. Um, then when I was at Los Alamos, um, I still follow the uh, literature on this. And uh, in the early uh, 2000s, I noticed that there were first commercial developments of this. Um, some started with just a little kit that you could use with a uh, uh, femtosecond laser if you had one. Um, but um, also some companies started to do actually more dedicated uh, lasers for generating this. Uh, they were started to be more, um, you know, a little bit less expensive and again, more dedicated so they had better properties for what I was looking for. Um, but it wasn't until when I started my faculty position here at Tech that I could ask for the money through my startup to purchase one of these uh, supercontinuum laser. And I did so in uh, 2009, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, only in 2010, uh, discussing with uh, my former advisor, Hans Mosmuller, we decided that it was worth writing a proposal to, um, to develop a photoacoustic and nephilometer system together with Pat Arnold also at the uh, University of Virginia Nevada. And uh, Hans really took the, the, the lead on that and brought a beautiful uh, proposal that got uh, funded and we developed, we, we showed that it was possible to do photographic measurements with, with this laser. And uh, the graph on the side here um, is really from the paper where we show in black the emission from the super continuum laser, very broad. And, uh, then the red one is the part of the spectrum that we were using for that paper that we published in 2013. Then for uh, another couple of years or so, I didn't really have projects with that. Um, and uh, so I, I let the lasers, you know, pretty much in the lab. Um, and uh, um, only in 2016, uh, Ravi Verma uh, contacted me and said, oh, I would like to do a sabbatical at uh, Michigan Tech and uh, can we discuss ideas? And so uh, I knew he was an expert in, uh, cavity enhanced, broadband cavity enhanced um, spectroscopy. And so I asked him why we don't uh, try to develop uh, an instrument. So as you can see, it was a very long history that, uh, um, you know, a little dream that was there in the uh, closet and uh, slowly uh, developing something, um, something hopefully useful uh, or at least interesting for us. Uh, but again, I want to underline this, is, this was a very low budget project. Um, now, I, I want to start a little bit uh, to motivate uh, this work. Why do we care about measuring extinction? And I take it a little bit on the white side here again for the benefit of the student, especially. Uh, I like this, uh, um, this picture from the Ganset Schwarz uh, paper, uh, BAMS paper in 2007, where they really kind of summarize all the complexity of waterfall in the atmosphere again. Uh, you know, this they uh, undergo many different processes that can be produced directly from uh, sources that have different sources that can be produced in the atmosphere, that can condense, evaporate, that can um, undergo uh, chemistry, uh, chemical transformation. Uh, they interact with clouds, uh, either uh, being affected by clouds or affecting clouds um, and transforming during the process. And uh, obviously they interact with the solar radiation. Now, my, most of my research is oriented to, or I mean, I mean, I'm most interested in uh, uh, the effect of aerosol on uh, climate. And so I like this, uh, um, this uh, picture here from the IPCC report where they kind of separate the interaction, I mean, the effect of um, 
uh, a result on climate through two main interaction. One is the aerosol radiation interaction and the other one is aerosol cloud interaction. Um, I won't really talk about the aerosol cloud interaction in here, even though it's, it's very interesting and important field, uh, but I will talk more about the aerosol radiation interaction where uh, the aerosol interact with the solar radiation uh, or, or also with the um, earth radiation uh, directly uh, or semi-directly in the sense that they will interact with the radiation and that will uh, affect the clouds through the semi-direct effect. I will actually focus mostly on the direct effect, actually the direct interaction of radiation with solar, uh, with uh, aerosol. Um, so like I mentioned before, we talk about broadband, but really um, how broad is limited by um, the availability of uh, substantially the technological limitation of building mirrors that can be very high reflectivity for this kind of uh, instruments uh, can, that can work on a broad, um, a broad range of wavelengths. Um, so we have to pick uh, uh, a wavelength range apart from 200 in the figure here from 100 to 400. Uh, part of the spectrum that's not accessible to us because the supercontinuum laser doesn't permit there. But most of the other uh, part of the spectrum, actually, uh, there is some good amount of emitted light in the supercontinuum laser, but we cannot cover that with any mirror. So we want to pick uh, part of the spectrum where there is a good amount of, uh, you know, uh, solar light. Obviously, the visible light that covers a lot of that, but it's not too broad. Um, so we pick the, the visible uh, part of the spectrum. And specifically, we focus on the lower part that we could reach with a supercontinuum laser, uh, meaning from about 400. In reality, we, we have meaningful data only from about 410, 420 to maybe 540, 550 uh, nanometers. And uh, uh, for two reasons. One is because, again, um, that's where we have a good amount of uh, solar radiation. And the other one is because uh, that's where particles interact uh, uh, nicely with the radiation. And um, also there is some interesting um, aerosol research that can be done there, um, you know, in terms, for example, of uh, brown carbon um, and the wavelength dependence of the extinction for that, uh, which we didn't get to do here, but the idea was to then use the instrument maybe for application in the field. So how do we quantify this? Uh, and, and this, you know, hopefully uh, if there are experts in the uh, audience will forgive my uh, naiveness here and the simplicity of the argument, but um, I want to just make uh, some points here. Or how do we quantify the effect of our soil on climate? Uh, we do that typically through relative force and mirror. And if you look at the Wikipedia definition, it gives you an idea of what that is. It's uh, just a change in net ingredients between two different layers of the atmosphere. Uh, by change, typically we're interested in the effect of humans and, um, on the climate, and so we mean change from now, let's say, or the future uh, with respect to pre industrial condition, conditions. Uh, and by net ingredients between two different layers of the atmosphere, we typically refer to the part of the atmosphere where most of the aerosol that we are interested in it is, uh, is confined, meaning the troposphere. So we are talking about typically the surface um, and the tropopassers. So, um, and typically, uh, this is, uh, you know, um, to, to motivate work on aerosol, people show some kind of uh, graph of the IPCC report. I like this one as the probability density function of the uh, relative forcing for uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols. And uh, you can see a couple of things here. Uh, the first is that greenhouse gas, uh, gases have a positive relative forcing, maybe center around uh, three or so um, uh, watts per meter square, just roughly speaking. And, um, um, they are definitely positive, meaning uh, warming, uh, you know, higher temperature than pre industrial conditions. And uh, that was all that typically negative, uh, with maybe something that would of one um, watts per meter square, minus one uh, watts per meter square. And, uh, um, and, and therefore that cause uh, cooling. But um, the, the, the point that I want to make here is that the total anthropogenic um, uh, forcing, that is the kind of the combination of the aerosol and greenhouse gases, is fairly broad, and that broadness is determined by both greenhouse and aerosol, but is definitely dominated by the uncertainties that we still have in aerosols. So that's why we still need to study uh, aerosols and measure their uh, properties. Now, what a lot of uh, people are interested in more is the temperature uh, change than not the relative forcing per se, uh, at least uh, you know more from a popular standpoint, if you would say. Um, but you can imagine that if uh, um, you increase the, num the amount of radiation that you have in your system, uh, the, the net radiation, then your temperature 
uh, will, will change, it will be a function of the radiative forcing. And when, um, when you have uh, something that is a function of uh, some variable, you can typically expand that in a polynomial um, series um, that is a Taylor expansion. And uh, the first two terms will be a constant and then a linear term. And uh, typically the, the higher terms they uh, decay uh, rapidly and they're less and less important if, if the, uh, the series is conversion, which is most of the cases is the case. Um, so anyway, um, when you look at uh, uh, changes in temperature, the constant goes away and you're left substantially with a linear term. So it's reasonable to, as a first approximation to assume that the relative forcing and the temperature change will be uh, proportional to each other or related to proportionality. Um, and uh, just to give uh, another reminder to the here idea of what that uh, coefficient will be in the order of, uh, roughly speaking, one Kelvin per each of one meter square. So if you go back to this figure and uh, you consider the uh, average uh, irradiance that reaches the surface, which um, uh, it's not the solar constant because it accounts for the transmission of the atmosphere, the uh, cloudiness of the atmosphere, um, the fact that the uh, surface of the atmosphere is curved, and that uh, you uh, illuminate, the, the sun illuminates only uh, half of the surface uh, in a specific time. Uh, you see that you have about 240 so what per meter square when you compare that with you know, three meters square or so for greenhouse gases, you see that you're talking about uh, one percent or so, very roughly speaking. So um, uh, that relates to the formula that we were talking about before, that linear relation uh, to something that you expect, uh, uh, meaning that that relative force will result in a few degrees uh, one, which is what we uh, are observing right now. So um, how do you calculate the uh, relative forcing, uh, relative, uh, yeah, the relative forcing of uh, aerosols? Uh, you can typically you have to do that with uh, fancy three-dimensional uh, high-resolution uh, transfer models, but it's uh, complicated. And for someone that is not a model like me, it's difficult sometimes to wrap my head around what is really happening. So it's nice to look at this simple analytical function, uh, one-dimension uh, model here from uh, here at the one uh, papers, and uh, sim there are similar formulas from others uh, um, that is substantially. I will break it down in three main uh, pieces. One is related to either the sun or the atmosphere, um, excluding the aerosol. Um, so clouds and, and gases and uh, the surface of the earth. And uh, the others instead are uh, the, the blue and the green are related to uh, the aerosol, the, the uh, aerosol optical thickness accounting for the concentration, how much aerosol you have in the column. Uh, of the atmosphere and uh, the asymmetry parameter and single scattered albedo kind of the parameters that really are determined by the, the specific aerosol, their shape, their um, size, um, their composition, and the wavelength as well. And uh, that uh, single scattered albedo, which is uh, more what I'm focused here on, uh, is um, to, to be calculated uh, requires knowledge of either the absorption and the scattering or the scattering and the extinction. And as, as some of these uh, three parameters, the scattering, and uh, I mean, two of these parameters, the scattering and absorption. So it's important to measure this. And uh, among those, the, the focus here in the presentation is the extinction. So I want to get back for a second, um, you know, to um, the idea of modeling these properties. So you can use uh, a me theory if you want on an aerosol, and, and that's kind of the typical. Uh, spherical cow approximation and that physicists often uh, do. Um, you assume that your cow is nice and spherical and it's uniform, and then you can account for diffraction, refraction, absorption, reflection, and calculate uh, substantially all the parameters that you need for calculating the relative force. But the reality, as I was showing at the beginning, and I have another example here, is that these aerosols are very complicated and they are sometimes far from sphere, sometimes they are spheres uh, sometimes are not homogeneous, there are a lot of complication uh, associated with it, and therefore it's important to, to do measurements. So I'm kind of trying to um, make the case here for instrumental developments, um, because often I think it's a little bit looked down, um, uh, you know, in, in the community um, uh, or also in the funding agency, sometimes just the, the development of an instrument doesn't seem like a real science, but uh, to me, it is because it's important to have new uh, new method to measure these quantities accurately and 
who, who, to measure them in this case, for example, uh, over a broader um, wavelength range. Um, so the idea of doing measurements of extinction is to uh, see how well these models do, um, and uh, if, if they're not doing well, or if uh, uh, too many tests are needed for actually carrying out the calculations in the model, you need to parameterize uh, their properties, and so the, the measurement help with, with that as well. So light extinction as uh, the topic here, uh, the concept is very simple. You, whenever you shine some light through a medium, um, it can be solid, liquid, or gases. Uh, um, and if there is a suspension of particles in it, in this case, which we talk about the results. Uh, in any event, whatever you know you have in the middle um, will uh, either scatter or absorb radiation and remove photons from uh, what is coming out on the other side. Um, and therefore, you have some input light, and uh, the intensity of the uh, light coming out is is smaller. And uh, we quantify that um, you know, by talking about, about light extinction. So that's what we are trying to measure with our instrument. Now, uh, because of conservation of energy, the light extinction is uh, substantially due to two main processes. One is the scattering. Um, light is just uh, scattered out of the main path uh, through uh, just a, it could be elastic or inelastic scattering process. And the other one is through uh, absorption. And I like this figure from uh, Warren's um, book on the clouds in a glass of beer, um, where he shows that the extinction really doesn't distinguish between scattering and absorption. Uh, in this case, you, when you look at the uh, reflected light, let's say, or scattered light from uh, the, um, or from the two containers here, you can see that you have a pink on the uh, left and uh, milky water on, on the right here. And when you take a projection of it, instead, when you look at what is transmitted through uh, both, they look like they extinguish the light. Um, one is milk is through scattering and the pink is through absorption in this case. So how do we uh, quantify that? I typically use uh, um, a beer Beck's law, uh, which relates the intensity of uh, the intensity that you measure um, outside of your instrument um, uh, equal to that of uh, the incoming radiation uh, multiplied by an exponential, um, where the uh, exponent with a mi and minus is the extinction coefficient, which is substantially is the extinction cross section times the number of um, you know, particles that, in, in this case, we are talking about the number of particles that are. Um, in your sample, and this the, the distance that you measure um, this uh, extinguish, uh, extinction uh, over. So obviously, if you have uh, the same concentration and you have some length, and then you take double the length, uh, uh, that will result in um, long, uh, higher uh, extinction. Um, so like I said, uh, to the extinction, uh, the contributions through absorption and scattering, so you have all of those together. but. They all have dimension of one uh, over length. Um, and that's because, uh, like I was talking about before, the extinction coefficient there is a product of the cross section, which is in um, dimensions of surface, um, and um, uh, multiplied by concentration, which is, has dimensions of volume. And so you have one over length. And that's good because it makes your exponent here of the exponential dimension as you want it, because D has a dimension of uh, length. So why I'm talking about that is because all the graph that I will show uh, will show these weird units, if you wish, uh, in inverse distance. And specifically, because typically the measure of extension is small, that's really the challenge here. Um, uh, the distance that uh, you get a good extension over are very big. And so instead of measuring in meters, we often you know, we express our values, uh, not even in kilometers, but in one over uh, megameters. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so you can measure the extinction either measuring scattering and absorption and sum them up, or you can measure extinction directly. Uh, I won't talk about uh, measurement of scattering and absorption so you can get the focus on extinction. How you can do that uh, is there are different ways. Uh, uh, one, you know, the simplest way that you can think of is to shine some light uh, across a, a container where you put your aerosol in and then uh, maybe uh, you put a mirror on the other side so to double the path and uh, then you measure what comes out um, uh, from the other side and uh, you take this ratio of uh, I, the intensity that you measure with respect to I naught, which is the intensity of the radiation that you send in. <coughs> um, 
The problem is that uh, well, with a system like this, this would work well for high extension values uh, because the path is small and therefore, um, you know, you, you don't have a lot of change in your uh, intensity. So what people came up to um, get around this uh, was to confine your um, measurement, uh, I mean, your, your box where you have the aerosol uh, with, um, confine the, the laser beam with uh, two mirrors uh, that will reflect the beam back and forth. And for example, if you're sending a laser pulse, um, this pulse will go back and forth. Some of it will leak out, some of uh, it will be scattered or absorbed uh, due to the aerosol. And you can measure the decay over time. And uh, this is the, the principle, the, the very simple way of looking at the uh, captive and down principle. Uh, <coughs> on, uh, if you measure this the time decay, you can determine the extinction. Um, the, the problem with that is that you need a relatively high um, time resolution uh, system. You need a, a pulse laser and things that will it helps at least. Um, <laughs> So people come up with other um, ideas as well. Um, the the culturing down is an excellent way to do these measurements, by the way, but there are other ways also. One is, uh, for example, if you have an LED and uh, you modulate it with, uh, let's say, a square wave and you send it in, because some photons will leak out first and some are, uh, later because of the um, reflecting back and forth and the extinction in the cell due to the result, you get uh, your initial um, uh, way from to change in shape in a sense, and from that you can also quantify uh, your um, extinction. That's also an excellent way to, to measure the extinction. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about uh, something even simpler, uh, which is uh, the idea of this paper, which is calling coherent uh, broadband cavity and extinction spectrometer a very long uh, term, and uh, I think a kind of uh, horrible acronym, but. Uh, uh, the idea is fairly simple. You send in light. Um, some of those uh, photons will leak out through the mirrors. Uh, some will be lost because of the aerosol that you have in. Some will be reflected back. And you have, uh, you know, you start from one pass to two passes, uh, three passes, uh, and, and uh, um, n passes, and so forth. And you can do that, um, substantially um, express that in terms of a nice um, series. Um, that allows you to uh, mathematically actually the series converts to a nice mathematical expression, uh, which is given here. Um, there is some simplification here, but it's um, overall like this where it's coming from. And uh, you can further simplify this for assuming that you're dealing with relatively uh, small losses, so not super high extensions and very high reflectivity mirrors. And uh, you get this simplified expression, which is easier to, to understand and to grasp. This is for a system that has multiple passes, like I was saying, and you can see that you have your ratio of phi naught to i, which is what you, you, you want. And then um, uh, you have a contribution of the reflectivity of the mirrors, and then you obviously have how big your, um, your um, cavity is, which in our case is just below one meter uh, about. And just to, uh, to kind of underline here, What's the advantage of reflecting back and forth? Well, we already said, uh, you know, conceptually you, you send back and forth a photon into this cavity. And so that the photon can experience uh, or can have more probability to experience uh, uh, either a scattering or an absorption process with aerosol. And therefore, um, you know, your signal should be better. But mathematically that's because if you have a single pass that one over R term goes away. Um, and so in other words, when you have this uh, cavity in a system, uh, in reality, instead of dealing with a distance d, you're dealing with an effective d over one over minus r. And if that r is, let's say, just as an example, it's 0 0.9, uh, one minus r will be uh, 0.1, and therefore d over 0 0.1 will be 10 times larger. So it will effectively enlarge your uh, path um, by a factor of 10. And the, the higher the reflectivity, uh, in theory, the better, uh, you know, the longer this effective. Uh, yes. uh, I'm saying in theory because in reality you have to fight with um, uh, injecting the photons into your system. So um, you have to find the right balance between uh, not having so high reflectivity that it's really hard to get photons into the cavity um, and having good sensitivity. So that's really what, uh, what you have to work on to find um, the, a good reflectivity curve, uh, mirrors uh, for your mirrors. Um, 
the specification of your members. This is a picture of the of, in, uh, taken from our lab in the, um, of the cavity. Uh, the reason I didn't talk about yet um, why we use two cavities. But the reason are two. One is that um, some people uh, suggested that uh, the supercontinuum laser might have uh, some spectral fluctuations, meaning the shape of the spectrum may change over time. Um, and so if you could collect the spectrum through a cavity that has the aerosol and one that doesn't, uh, you can account for those fluctuations. But maybe may, even more important is that often um, the, in the atmosphere, we don't have only aerosol, we can have also gases that absorb uh, in those wavelengths, especially nitrogen dioxide and uh, ozone. Um, and so what we do, we flash um, this uh, cavity, this is the reference cavity, with um, uh, the same air after we remove the particles. So, so the gases will be subtracted automatically from uh, you know, our measurement in the sample cavity. Now, like I said at the beginning, um, I'll go to the next slide, it's a bit enlarged here, the schematic. This is directly from the Schwarzer paper, but um, this was a very low budget development. So um, I had only one spectrometer um, in the lab available. Um, and so we, we were thinking about how can we use only one spectrometer. Um, there is also a practical advantage of using only one spectrometer is that um, for, for both cavities I'm talking about. Um, and the fact is that then, um, you know, if there is some drift in the uh, camera, since it, uh, cam the CCD detector of the uh, spectrometer, for example, over time or things like that, uh, both cavity will experience kind of the same um, if the measurement is done relatively uh, quickly. Um, so it helps to have a one spectrometer also from a practical standpoint, but really the main point was that we, we only had um, one uh, spectrometer available and then wanted to buy another one. Uh, so we take the supercontinuum laser, we split it with a beam splitter, we send half uh, of uh, the light through the reference cavity, half through the sample cavity. Um, on uh, this arm, uh, it's just a mirror, we reflect back uh, the sample cavity signal, and we have a chopper where we can substantially uh, turn on or off uh, the, the collection of the photons coming out of the sample cavity. And then we have a beam splitter, where we recombine, in this case, it's not that we use it as a beam combiner. We combine uh, the beams from the two cavities into uh, the spectrometer. So we have both um, beams from both uh, uh, cavities overlapping uh, very well and entering the spectrometer at the same angle um, and uh, uh, measured. Not quite simultaneously because we're using a chopper. Um, so with about a uh, frequency like I will show in a moment of about one hertz, so one per second. Um, this is an example of the data. So with the, with the spectrometer, we collect data for 20 milliseconds. Each point here corresponds to 20 milliseconds. Um, so we collect the full spectrum for 20 milliseconds. Um, and in the meantime, we switch back and forth between having both cavities and having only the reference cavity that was shown before. Um, so that we can then subtract the two through some lovely programming uh, that uh, Susan and Ashwari developed. And then uh, we can substantially separate out the reference and the sample uh, spectra. Um, we improved since uh, we published this paper a little bit, the two spectra looks much more similar to each other. In this case, there were the, the two systems were a little bit unbalanced for for technical details that I don't want to talk about here, but um, uh, but now uh, they look much more similar to each other. But in any event, what we did here, we just uh, look at dry air and we calculated substantially uh, scaling factors so that we could have both on top of each other. And then when we introduced the aerosol in the sampling um, uh, cell, uh, we can see how that will decrease. And uh, from the ratio of those uh, signals, we calculate extension. Um, there is one uh, caveat with all of this, with, uh, you know, I was talking about the kind of simplicity of the system. Uh, the caveat is that you need to know the reflectivity of the mirror. So um, it's something that you need to know to calculate extinction. So the first thing that we did was to try to calibrate the reflectivity. And we did that uh, by using, uh, we, we choose to use uh, an absorbing gas, which was uh, nitrogen dioxide in this uh, with that range absorbs nicely. Um, we diluted it from a cylinder that we had uh, 100 ppm uh, and a two down to a few ppms. And then uh, uh, we sent it into the, ch the chamber, we accounted for the wavelength dependence of, of the uh, spectrometer resolution, and things like that, and 
uh, we uh, then calculated um, the reflectivity of the mirrors. Um, and we use that to then uh, calculate the extinction in the follow-up measurements. Uh, then uh, we started doing aerosol measurements, and the first thing that we decided to do was to use uh, uh, polystyrene atmosphere, uh, which, as most of you will know, are often used for uh, calibrating instruments or test instruments in the lab. And, uh, and so um, uh, the nice part of those is that uh, uh, if you know the concentration relatively well, then uh, because they're very spherical and uniform, and you, the industry refraction is now uh, like well. You can use uh, uh, me uh, theory, as I was talking about before, in this case, it's a good, very good approximation to calculate um, what you would expect in terms of the essential coefficient. So these two um, maps are uh, substantially maps of uh, uh, the extinction versus time and wavelength for the measurements and here they meet here. Um, and they resemble uh, each other uh, relatively well. And if you want to compare uh, specifically, um, uh, you know, more um, simply, let's say on the graph, here is uh, what we show in the paper. Um, we, we took a five nanometer span centered around 527 nanometers, which is where the senior was fairly strong on our uh, uh, laser and uh, spectrometer. Um, and uh, we compare here the theory and the measurements that they compare quite uh, closely. Uh, um, then the next step was to uh, compare the wavelength dependence instead. So this is kind of uh, integrating um, uh, I mean, um, a time series over, uh, you know, a specific wavelength at the end. Here is that it was integrating over time and uh, showing instead um, in different wavelength span of five uh, nanometers each and um, uh, comparing uh, the measurements with the, in, in green uh, with in blue the mean calculations again. Uh, now, I had a very interesting email um, uh, just before uh, this presentation uh, an hour or so ago. Um, where they uh, were asking me why uh, we choose a power fit, and there is really no practical, no, no super good reason, if not that uh, most people think in terms of entrance exponent, which is uh, you know the, the, the exponent of a power fit, and so we wanted to provide something that people can relate to. So that's really the main reason then, but but that's the right curve. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do was okay. Um, this is uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, uh, this was for lattice field, this was for sodium chloride particles that were not monodispersed anymore, they were fully dispersed. So a little bit more representative of here particles in the other field. And uh, then what we did, uh, we wanted to compare in time again, uh, as a time series with uh, some other measurements. And uh, sodium chloride is not absorbing, so the extinction should be equal to the total scattering. So uh, we use a very old, again, you know, it was a very low budget project. So um, I had uh, an inflammator that I purchased for a couple of hundred dollars on eBay at some point, we recalibrated it and tested it in the past and it was running fairly decently. Uh, we use that to compare with cavity uh, system. Um, there are some um, tweaks, I mean, some tweaks, some uh, things that one has to uh, account for there because the nephilometer had its own, um, the, 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 the source of the nephilometer, it's, uh, uh, its own uh, wavelength uh, bandwidth that uh, is different from ours, and so we had to count for those things. Um, uh, but in the end, uh, you know, we tried to compare Apple with Apple as much as possible, and uh, again, we took compare fairly um, positively. And finally, I kind of conclude with this uh, plot, and I'll conclude the presentation, but almost here, uh, we wanted to apply this to something that is maybe more relevant to uh, the atmosphere um, uh, or, or something additional that is different from just a purely scattering. Uh, aerosol like the sodium chloride. And so we decided to use it, um, our instrument on uh, kerosene soup. And so um, we we have a, a Walmart uh, a process uh, um, lamp that we use to generate soup and uh, it works quite well um, for this kind of experiment. So we just generate soup. Um, we use it in the past um, for many other experiments. And uh, then we took a spectrum. Um, again, we put here the power fit just as a, um, you know, a guidance for those that thinks more in terms of entrance exponent. Uh, but that, that entrance exponent seems reasonable with other measurements. For example, if you compare with what uh, we measure with a, a super continuum for the acoustic um, instrument that we, we, we developed that I talked about at the beginning um, that Nakur Sharma uh, wrote an AMT paper about. 
Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, that was the first application. It was kind of the end uh, of that, uh, but then um, probably was long gone uh, from, from Michigan Tech as well also. Um, and uh, we were just wrapping up things. Um, the next idea would be to apply this to measure the ground cap. Uh, I saw that thing could be very interesting. Uh, that's where maybe the um, web independence really, um, the, I mean, the, the web resolution uh, of the system would be quite uh, interesting. Um, I want to kind of end with a couple more slides here. Uh, one is about the instrument sensitivity. Um, not to, to, to say this too many times, but uh, this was a low budget, so it could be improved. Uh, there are many ways that the instrument could be improved. Uh, so the same, the precision that was determined from you know an element bias kind of uh, plot um, is not uh, definitely it's not fantastic or anything, but it's good enough for uh, laboratory measurements and. Uh, uh, for um, measurements in uh, polluted or, or you know, semi-polluted uh, regions. Um, uh, and the, obviously the uh, procedure depends on the wetland because uh, uh, of especially the uh, supercontinuum laser uh, emits differently in different parts of the spectrum. Um, and uh, the accuracy was approximately estimated to be in the order of 7% or so. Um, I wanted just to conclude that uh, um, there were some spin-off, let's say, developments from this. Um, not exactly the same system, but uh, using the same mirrors. Um, when, when we had this uh, uh, mirror uh, done in the pool, um, we were able to get 10 of them with the same characteristic. And so uh, we used four for our system, a couple broke over, uh, over the years. Um, and then we sent uh, a few more to our colleague, uh, colleagues, uh, Ravi Bhatman in, in India, and uh, uh, they recently published a paper also in, in ASD where they showed that the instrument was able to, to measure, um, uh, again, the spectral dependence of uh, extinction on ambient uh, aerosols um, in, in China. And uh, um, Ashwarya, uh, the same uh, that uh, uh, led the, the, the paper that I've been discussing here today, um, is also preparing a paper where uh, she's attempting to retrieve the industrial refraction um, of uh, ambient aerosol using uh, this technique, which will be very, I mean, this uh, instrument, which will be very interesting because we we'll provide a, a, a wavelength result um, retrieval of, of those uh, indexes, which is something that is definitely not and uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end there and take any question or uh, comments. Like I said, I'm not an expert, so if you have comments, uh, you know, feel free to jump in. Thank you so much for listening. And again, thank you to AAAR. I forgot to mention before that um, I, I really appreciate uh, the effort uh, of AAAR, not, not, some, not only for inviting me here, but really for um, pushing forward the science on um, uh, aerosol that is, uh, um, is really uh, great and important for, for us. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Masolini. It was an interesting presentation and it's, it's quite thorough explanation on aerosol extinction. So we have the flow for our questions. Um, I have a question from the chat. Uh, it's from Stephen. I think he was posting it um, around the slide 24 to 25. It's about the measurements of intensity. I would say if Stephen is here, so he can append to this. The question is, when you combine the beams, aren't you getting interference, either positive or negative, depending on the wavelength? Mm -hmm. Um, no, we did, we did not observe um, anything uh, like that, at least not uh, very evident. Um, um, okay. I, I don't have, I mean, um, um, I, I really more uh, talk about my observation, let's say, of the spectra. If you look at the spectra, there, there is no particular evidence that that's the case. I was a little bit uh, hesitant because there is one issue with the spectrometer, which is uh, um, the window in the front sometime can, the window itself, 
generating some uh, ethylon in the lipid, which uh, relates to interference effects. And those might be a little bit responsible for some of these ripples uh, up here, but that's a bit of a separate issue, I think, uh, with respect to the process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? So Dr. Masolini, uh, I believe this is a field deployable instrument. Um, that's a very good question. The, the one that we uh, use, um, not so much in the sense it could be, uh, but we never really package it, let's say. So it's all on, on an optical table, uh, which is this one where we have it here. <clears throat> um, you can you know see that everything is clamped down to an optical table. Um, the laser is it's not visible, but it's here in the, in the corner on the table. Uh, the fiber of the laser comes in here. Um, so, is not exactly field the problem. We, we, our idea was to use it in the lab, uh, but the, the, the question is very good. Uh, um, and that's why I put this um, slide here. The system that uh, uh, Varma and his uh, students developed um, is based on the same mirror and the, the same conceptual idea, but it uses only one cavity um, and it uses a different, different source. It uses a laser driven um, uh, source. Um, that um, has a very high spectral stability. And so um, they felt like one cavity would be sufficient for that. And uh, that's actually the plot. So they, they took it in the field. So. And we have another question from Carrie. Do you ever swap the reference and sample cavity meters to ensure there isn't a systemat systematic difference between the two channels? Um, so over the different alignments and tests and so forth, we definitely did it, but um, mostly what we do is not so much to swap the mirrors, what we do is to just flash also the sample cavity with the same um, air that uh, we flash the reference cavity with. And in a sense, that's what was done here. Uh, we just flash uh, dry air into both cavities and, um, and then compare them. Uh, this is only one example when we were calculating this scaling factor, but this scaling factor can be calculated um, every time that we do, let's call it a background check or, or a zero, or where we just send uh, particle free air into the, both cavities. Any other questions? And uh, Dr. Maslini, when you're deploying it in the real, you know, real scenarios, do you think it's it can be used to measure the aerosol optical depth, the AOD, also? Uh, if you mean the the column integrated, uh, you know, in, in the atmosphere, um, that's yeah, uh, different parameter, right? Because you have to integrate over over, over the atmosphere. At least that you take the instrument at different elevations, like deploying it on a on an airplane or something like that. Um, I, I don't know if that's what you meant, but um, so obviously it will measure the uh, extinction property of the aerosol where you de deploy the instrument. So if it's at the surface, that would be where you measure at the surface. If you put it on an airplane, that's, that's where you are going to measure. So. Okay. If we do not have any other questions, um, we can conclude today's lecture.